It's a lovely habit that we have here in Australia that we begin our public gatherings by being mindful of the long history of mutuality and stewardship that the indigenous people have had with this land that we are on. That history is particularly embodied in the wisdom of the elders. And by paying our respects to the elders, we slow down a little from our hurrying and we take a longer and a broader view of things. Here in this place, we particularly acknowledge the Baramatical people who have always lived in close association with the Parramatta River that flows along this side of campus. The river was a big part of what sustained them. When European settlers came to Sydney Harbour, they found it arid and the soil difficult to cultivate. But when they came up the river, they found rich soil in this area and the relief of knowing that they would be able to sustain themselves. May you, may we, this evening and over the course of this weekend, also find here, on this fertile river bank, things that sustain us. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you for all the work that you do to unite the community. What a blessing it is to have you here. Now, before we start, just some housekeeping. So the toilets are at the foyer, both at the left and right-hand side. Um, and the exits, so in case of any emergency, just follow the green signs at the door or just find any door. Um, we invite you to check out the stores outside. There are some cool, awesome stuff there. And you have a gift right at your seat. So the magazines are a gift from Santi Forest Monastery. You can also get more copies um, to give away at the free distribution table outside at the foyer. So we now would like to respectfully invite Aya Karunika from Santi Forest Monastery for her welcome, for her welcome speech. Please join me in inviting her and welcoming her on stage. Thank you, Alice. And uh, on behalf of Santi Forest Monastery, I would like to invite you all for this very special uh, Dhamma talk, which is the starting of a very beautiful journey, a journey into stillness. So, and if it is a journey, and if we think about the journey in a ship, and we have an amazing captain to guide us, what better? <laughs> than to have Ajahn Brahm himself here with us to guide us on this beautiful journey into the stillness of the mind and stillness of the heart. A very, very appropriate time in the world for us to have this because we are all very busy, far away from stillness. So I hope you all will take this opportunity, not only for the Dhamma talk today, but a whole day of practice tomorrow in this very space, and also another retreat at Santi Forest Monastery in Bandanoon. So I welcome you all for this again, and I also would like to welcome Ajahn Brahm for accepting our invitation. It is I who made the invitation. I am one of Ajahn Brahm's students for uh, the past two decades, and uh, I have come to New South Wales from Western Australia, from Dhammasara Nans Monastery, and we have been invited to take over the management of Santi uh, and establish, re-establish the Nans community. So it has been three years since I have not seen my teacher and guide, and that was the initial a reason why we invited Ajahn and then we joined force with Metta Center with uh, a large group of volunteers to make a very big event happen for the benefit of all of you in the Eastern States. So thank you so much Ajahn for coming and guiding us for this event. Thank you.
Thank you, Aya. And very grateful for all the incredible work you and Santi have done to make this event possible for us all. Now, the moment has arrived. Tonight, we are extremely honored to have Arjun Brahm right here with us. We would like to invite Arjun Brahm to guide us through a meditation, followed by a Dharma talk on the power of stillness. There will be an opportunity to ask questions after. And without further ado, Arjun Brahm. <laughs> Very good. So what I intend to do is to do a guided meditation for about 20, 25 minutes. Is that okay with you all? Whether it's okay or not okay, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> but nevertheless, I will do most of the guiding. And when we are, get towards maybe 10, 15 or 18 minutes of the guidance, that's when I usually be quiet to let you continue the meditation by yourself because I want to allow you to experience the stillness, the peace and just how easy it is when you don't stop interfering with things, you just let it be. It's not that hard and then when you can experience some of that stillness and peace it gets you kind of addicted in a very good way, in a peaceful way there's something which is so noble and beautiful. And once you do get kind of into the path of meditation, it has enormous benefits, and I'll be talking about those benefits uh, in the talk part of this evening. But first of all, let's um, get ourselves comfortable to be able to do maybe about 25 minutes of meditation. Okay. I know that those little seats aren't the most comfortable, but it's not that long. And if you want to have a comfortable seat in the future, then you come and give public talks. This is really comfortable. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. There will be people coming in at any time, so please uh, let people come in and sit down whenever they need to. So usually start meditation by making sure the body is calm and content and it's not causing any problems. So with your eyes closed, how do you feel? And even though I meditate so many hours every day, I still have to make sure that my body is in a good position. Once it's in a reasonable good condition, I don't accept that. I go more carefully through my body. And I'll tell you why we do this in a moment. First of all, with my eyes closed, it's like I'm in my cave where I live over in uh, Bodhinyana Monastery in uh, the West. I can't see anybody. And it's like no one else exists. I just have my body, my mindfulness and my kindness. And I want to make sure that my body receives that mindfulness and kindness. So I start checking on my feet. How do I do that? I just ask a simple question. Feet, how are you? And when you take this seriously, you can soon get into contact with your feet. Your mind and the feelings in your feet can connect. So that is what I'm doing now. I don't lie to you. At this moment, I am experiencing the sensations in my feet. The toes, the heels, the soles of the feet, the uppers. And my purpose is to make sure they're comfortable. 
In order to do that, I make sure that I add this kindness to the mindfulness. I'm kind to my own feet. I have to be aware, first of all, to understand how they feel. And then the awareness gives me feedback. If I change something, adjust my feet, I can soon discover whether they are really comfortable or not. And I'm always willing to make, quite, make slight adjustments so my feet do feel comfortable. It is a process which is important in all meditation called kindfulness. It allows you to get to know the feelings in your body and get to use that understanding to create some comfort, calm, even health in your own body. So now I'm feeling the sensations in my feet settle down, become at ease. And then I move my attention to the, to the lower legs, including the ankles. How are you feeling right now? By asking a question, it's what I do every day when I see some friends or see some of the monks and nuns I know. How are you? But now I'm doing that to parts of my own body. Getting to know them. Getting to be kind to them. Being able to relax them. So now I can feel the calves of my legs, my ankles, nothing much is happening there, but I check them out anyway. But I always must add that kindness, that softness, just like a mother looks at her child to make sure that they're okay, they're comfortable, they're not afraid. And they're relaxed to the max. Sometimes if they ever pick up uh, an ache or a pain or a bruise or a twinge. I stay there and give this beautiful sense of relaxation and peace until that feeling disappears. I move up to the knees. Many people have sore knees. I've been sitting cross-legged like this for about over 50 years. My knees are great. I think it's because I care for them. Right now I can feel any sensations in my own knees. As I'm feeling them, I learn how to relax them. The mindfulness and the kindness. It's like one of the things which I do, I imagine those knees expanding getting bigger, it's only imagination, but that allows any tightness and tensions to be relieved, any inflammation to be loosened. Or imagine like the body's energies in Indian uh, medical ideas, it's like winds going through the body. In Chinese, qi, the same thing but just flows of energy through parts of your body, and I want to make sure that those flow freely with no blockages. I can feel my knees relaxing. It's hard for me to say this, but my left knee felt very tense when I started. Now it's loose and easy. It's going to be comfortable, I know, for the rest of the meditation, but also I've learning and practicing this skill of awareness, kindness, and the consequent peace which it gives to parts of my body. But then I sweep my attention up my thighs and the skin and the bones in my upper legs. It's making sure that they also receive my care. They're not ignored. 
and I'm caring, caring for my own body. And I learn how to relax it. Relax it so much. And now my whole lower legs feel like they've been soaking in a bath. And I go to my buttocks. They're feeling the pressure of a body against the cushions of this sofa. For you, it is a little chair. Can you feel that? See if you could make that feeling even on both sides of your buttocks. Because when it's even, there's not one part which is more strong than the other part. You will find that the feeling, once it evens out, starts to disappear. And then I go to my back. First of all, the waist. Often when I sit meditation, I straighten up my back, but I know that's not really possible on the softness and the makeup of this sofa I'm sitting on. If you're in a chair, you may try just moving your back away from the backrest. But if you prefer leaning back, fine. But I'm now just moving my back slightly, this way and that way, to find the optimum position. I'm using mindfulness, kindness, feedback from the mindfulness. If I find something which is wrong, which can be improved, I do something. But sometimes, all I really need to do is just to observe and be kind. And the problem solves itself. Then I go to the bottom of my torso again. How does, I f does it feel in the bottom of my digestive tract? Because I'm a monk, nuns are the same. But we do have you know, sometimes some digestive problems. And I want to heal those by just learning how to relax my own colon, my own <sighs> intestines. I sweep upwards with my attention, always with kindness. To your digestive tract, may you be peaceful, happy, at ease. It actually works. My mindfulness tells me it's working. My whole digestive tract starts to feel so comfortable. Moving up to my stomach, which is pretty empty now because we only eat in the morning. Moving up to my lungs with so much respiratory diseases these days, I like to be kind to my lungs, make sure they're cared for, so they can heal themselves if there's any infection anywhere. They can feel good, cared for, looked after. And I move from my lungs up to my heart region. One of the things which I've been teaching a lot and when I go back to Western Australia on Tuesday, giving my annual speech at Solaris Cancer Care. I've been going there for over 30 years, teaching. And I ask people when I'm there, when they sweep, to their chest. How does your chest feel? So too many people, women especially, suffer from breast cancer. Sometimes you can feel it before the doctor sees it. When you're sweeping your attention to that part of your body, how does it feel? 
says, your body should know it really well. If there's some tightness, slight ache, something out of the ordinary, don't worry about it. Just put your attention on it and care for it. The mindfulness and the kindness can release any tension, any tightness. And when that is released, when it's relaxed in that area, then healing happens. I go up to my shoulders. I don't know why, but if I don't do this, my shoulders get very tense. I don't know about yours. So one trick to relax my own shoulders is actually just to scrunch them up, to go the opposite direction at first. And I scrunch up my shoulders as much as I possibly can, and then I let go. And they become more relaxed than when I started. It's like pushing a ball up a hill, then letting it fall, and it goes further down the hill than when you started. That's what I've just done with my own shoulders. And it also tells me, reminds me, what it means to let go. Not to pull anything, squash anything, stretch anything, but let everything become loose and free. And then I go down my arms, making sure they're all comfortable. But I get to my hands. Because I'm holding a microphone, I'm used to this now, so I just check the fingers and the hand, make sure they're as comfortable as can be expected. Just even being concerned about my own fingers and their position. Are they comfortable? If you want to move, please move. It shows you really do care about something like comfort. And then I go to my, back to my shoulders again, and my neck. The trick of not having any neck pain is just making sure the head on top of the neck is properly balanced. Not too far forward, not too far back, not to the left and the right. And it's beautiful optimum position. And once the neck feels good, then I go to the front of my face. And there I get to know the muscles around the forehead, around the eyes, the nose and the mouth. Because you all know that your emotional world, negative emotions are played up by contortions of your facial muscles. That's why you can look at a person and tell whether they're at peace, whether they're afraid, whether they're angry. Learning how to relax those muscles on the front of your face gives you some freedom from the negative emotions and your face feels relaxed. And having done a part by part sweeping mindfulness and kindness and general relaxation of the whole body I now look at my body united, not in parts, but as a whole. It works every time for me. My whole body feels so at ease, relaxed. But it's not just for relaxation and health. Because that relaxation appears pleasurable. It appears happy. I was afraid of that at first. I thought, I can't go watching happiness. But when I did, the relaxation went even deeper. So if you can feel your body happily relaxed, at ease, open, free, not contracted, then you find that relaxation goes really, really deep. You 
your body feels good. Good enough now to put it aside, let it go. We go to the mind. In order to understand what to look at, for years I've been encouraging people to ask themselves, just like you ask your feet, how are you? Ask your mind, how peaceful are you? Because peace is something which exists in the mind. How peaceful are you right now? And how, out of care for your own mind, how can you bring that state of peace into more, deeper peace, more stable peace? What is the key to be able to establish peace inside and make it even deeper? That's where you find simple things like present moment awareness. The past, you don't learn from the past as much as you learn from the present. And worrying about the future, if you really were concerned about your future, you should put more attention into where your future is being made which is in the present. When you just stay in this moment, you find the peace gets stronger and stronger. And the last thing in this short meditation, see if you can be silent inside. Stop giving things names. Stop trying to find out connection between things. Stop the intellectual process of trying to understand through naming and connection and similarities. Learn to be silent, to know without giving anything a name. I will be quiet for five minutes now.
getting close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel? Don't give it words. But just know its qualities, peace, beauty, freedom. What is peace like? As you start to come out from the meditation, how is your body right now? How relaxed and at ease is it? This is where we get very clear mindfulness of a body and mind which is starting to relax quite deeply. It feels great. I'm now going to ring the gong three times. When the gong finishes sounding for the third time, please come out of the meditation. something magic about this type of meditation because usually when I start there's not so many people here but now I open my eyes there's more people have arrived it's sometimes the magic it multiplies <laughs> people <laughs> excellent okay now straight away just from the meditation which I just led Hopefully you could experience some of this magic of stillness, the power of meditation. One of the first things I wanted to say, you know, because this uh, university made this hall available for us, is one of the first times I noticed, you know, just the worldly results of meditation was when I was doing my final examinations in theoretical physics at Cambridge University in 1972. In those days, everything in this British system depended upon these series of exams called finals. Everything else didn't count at all. This, these series of exams were over six days. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as well. A three-hour paper in the morning, three-hour paper in the afternoon, one day after another. That was high tension. There were certain ordinary subjects like astrophysics of the galaxy and quantum mechanics and stuff like that. But nevertheless, I was told at the time, I was brainwashed at the time, that this was really, really important. And I often say to people, if only I had known that I was going to become a monk, I wouldn't have bothered so much. But I never knew that at the time. So anyway, I did my very best. But one thing which I did, which really helped enormously, and that's why I'm sharing it with you today, is that at lunchtime, I had an hour for lunch, a three-hour paper in the morning, three-hour exam in the afternoon. The hour for lunch, I never had any lunch. I wasn't a monk yet. I had a big breakfast, a big dinner in the evening, lunchtime for one hour. I went to my room, sat on a cushion and meditated. I was already a Buddhist by then. I was so grateful what that meditation did to me. Because what happened was that I closed my eyes 
Have a guess what the first thing which came into my mind was. The morning exam. You just done this really important exam, given everything you've got, three hours of paper. Did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? What have I done? Even logically, we know that you can't change it. It's in the past. Good, bad, it's already finished. But how many of you can not really care about it, can let it go? I knew I needed to let it go, to rest, to relax. It was only because that I trained in meditation that you could let go of the past. The meditation which I was just teaching you, that first part about body scan, one of the main things I was achieving, you were in the present moment for about 15 or 20 minutes. Following what I was suggesting, how do you feel in your legs? How do you feel in your, uh, in your knees? How do you feel in your butt? It was bringing you into this present moment. That by itself gives you some quietness and some peace. So anyway, because I'd learned this for such a long time, actually at that time, not such a long time, I could still let go of the morning exam. The next thing which I noticed, I was only meditating for half an hour, the next thing I noticed, the afternoon exam. I started thinking, what's coming up afterwards? Should I prepare myself? Should I go open the books? You know, do some last minute swatting? But I realized I'd done that before. And I've mentioned this in so many universities and schools. Everything you look at half an hour before the examination never comes up, not once. Total waste of time. So I decided not to worry about the future exam. And this is what I say when the future is being made right now. So instead of worrying about the future exam, I just let it go and came back into this present moment. And that's when I got a shock. Every, the first day, it really sort of shook me. The next days, I could anticipate it. I was physically shaking. I was only 20 years of age doing the final exams, but still physically shaking. This was high stress. A three hour exam in just, you know, uh, theoretical physics, and this was going to be my whole life depend upon this, I thought. And so physically, I was shaking. But what really shocked me, I was not aware of that at all. I never noticed that. I was thinking in my head about exams, not how my body felt. Once I could see that, I could relax it. This is what I was telling you, just how you can relax all parts of the body, even incipient breast cancers. I say this, I'm going to pause on that one because that's really, really, really important for many of you. I saw this experiment, one of the other things I did at Cambridge was um, psychic research. Every year we got this hypnotist to come up and show some of the stuff which hypnotism can, can perform. And one of the things which he did once, you know, I was there for three years, went every year to this demonstration, had a piece of wood, four inch nail on the end. And he hypnotized one of his students and he made a student uh, believe that this nail on the end of the piece of wood was red hot. And he touched the student on the arm with this nail. This student uh, cried out in pain. It was only at room temperature. You could have touched everybody in here. No one would have felt a thing. It was just ordinary. But because he believed it was red hot, he shouted out in pain. I could understand that. What really shook me was to see a blister come up on that part of the hand which was touched. That's impossible. It was just room temperature. But because he believed it was a blister, it was, a, it was red hot, it actually made a burn on his arm. And that's why sometimes I say with even these incipient breast cancers. If you can actually make a blister, 
just through the mind, through thought. Why can't we overcome a tumor? Same process, but one is beneficial. So anyway, that's what I was, for me, was just shaking. And I never noticed that before. Once I noticed it, it was pretty easy to relax the body so much that all that shaking vanished. And then the next thing which I noticed, the last thing which I noticed in that meditation, <coughs> was just how tired my brain was. And of course, it's obvious, three hour exam, you're just pushing your brain to its limit. And I was, the only way I could describe it, because I was English, it was like a tea bag, which had already been used twice, and I had just nothing left. <laughs> and that's how, you know, how I felt. Even, okay, I shared this with you, even today, coming on on a flight, getting a nice lift from Alex and his wife over there to the, the house. Well, I stayed for an hour and a half, two hours. And then they said, oh, you can have a nice room. You can sit in or lay down if you want to. I said, no, I'll just sit down and meditate. I was tired. Of course I was tired. I'm just busy working. This is for Aya Karunika as well. You work really, really hard. I work really, really hard. But I've got this little trick which I use. I had an hour and a half by myself in the room and I just meditated. I've done this so many times. Sit down and when you start meditating, bleh, you feel dull, tired. Your brain's got hardly much energy at all. Because, you know, you've been active, traveling. You know, I'm, this, I'm over 72 now. I'm an old monk. I still keep pushing myself. But nevertheless, you know how to do this. You meditate it, nice and quietly, and the energy starts coming back. And when it comes back, oh, really nice energy. <laughs> so, and I know it's nice energy because I, I am a sort of a playful, silly monk sometimes, telling stupid jokes. I apologize for my jokes, which I say, actually, I don't really, I can't stop it. You have to accept that. That's part of the course. But you get energy up. And when I get energy up after meditating, of course you can give a lovely talk. I'm not reading this out, it's not prepared. The preparation is trying to meditate beforehand and getting the energy up to contact the Dhamma. And so that energy, when it comes out, that's a power of stillness. For me, when I was still as a student, after maybe 10 minutes of just being still, all the energy of my brain came up. So the afternoon exam, I always did really well. And one of the things which my fellow students told me, they said that I was the only student at Cambridge in that year who went into the afternoon exams with a smile on their face. Apparently, they never said anything at the time, only afterwards they thought I was cheating. <laughs> Actually, I was, but not in an illegal way. I was doing something which no one else knew how to do, was energize my mind, so it could perform to its best. And I give talks in so many places, many of you may have heard that before, but there's one of the people who heard this many years ago, it was one of my old friends. He was Rabbi Moshe Bernstein. I deliberately tried to make friends with people of other paths and religions, simply because I never wanted myself to be just tied and just getting feedback from people of the same path and religion. I wanted them to check me out to make sure that you know, I wasn't hiding or escaping. We became a good friend, especially once because you know, he came to see me to talk about rebirth. And straight away when he wanted to talk to me about rebirth, I said, I never believed that uh, the Jewish tradition believed in rebirth. 
He said, I do. When I said that to another rabbi I met, he said, well, you know, he's a bit you know, on his own on that one, said the senior rabbi. In other words, Moshe Bernstein, he was a rebel. And I appreciated him, respected him for that. So we became good friends. Are you supposed to think for yourself? Or are you just to believe what I say? Or what you believe the Buddha said? How should you know truth and respect that truth? Please ask questions later. Please challenge. And if it doesn't meet the challenge, reject it. I've done that all my life as a scientist. The Royal Society of Physics over in London, founded about 300 years ago, Francis Bacon, I believe, he said the only way we can take things like science further is not to put out a theory and try and prove it, but to put out a theory and try and disprove it the best you possibly can. And if it can withstand all these incredible smart people saying, this can't be right, this can't be right, this can't be right, if they can't prove it wrong, it's liable to be correct. These days, from what I see in science, people always try and want to prove things rather than trying their hardest to disprove them. And I was like that with Dhamma as well try and see any faults in there at all and be courageous enough to look for those faults. If you can't find any faults in some of the teachings of the Buddha, say, then you can understand these incredibly powerful teachings and true. So anyway, that's where you started to find out just how powerful this meditation is in your real life. But it's not just a powerful in your real life and just giving you energy, giving you good health. It's also giving you wisdom too. How many of you here uh, accept the truth of rebirth? It's not even half. Don't worry. If you don't believe in rebirth in this life, you will in your next. <laughs> <laughs> but how can you know for sure? For sure, what does for sure mean? One of the powers of stillness, I think you understand by now that stillness is my word for deep meditation, for samadhi, and that's a pretty accurate translation. One of the results of samadhi is in Buddhism is what we call five hindrances are subdued. Five hindrances are just roughly, it's not, this is not accurate or what I'm saying, the definitions, is like wanting, negativity, restlessness, dullness, and doubt. If you have any one of those, if you want something, you usually see what you want to see and you just reject what is too troubling for you to see. The, because I haven't given talks in Sydney for a while, the simile of the flower pot. Remember that simile? No, not many, so. Similarly, the flower pot goes like this. This was one of my friends. The first Buddhist I ever met became a lifelong friend. He became, he was a Buddhist. He was a theoretical physicist as well. He became a student of Stephen Hawking's. I became a student of Ajahn Chah. He always said I made the better choice. But a student of Stephen Hawking's now this was a big time, he was, his name is Bernard Kai, emeritus professor, because he's old now like me, of uh, theoretical physics at Queen Mary College in London University. 
a smart fellow. One of the things which he did, uh, was one of his friends did, in uh, Imperial College in London, a top university. It's actually part of University of London, but a top college. He said he'd found the secret of levitation. And he was going to demonstrate it in one of the lecture halls in Imperial College in front of his peers, other mostly physicists, people who spent their life doing experiments, who knew the experimental method better than anybody. In front of them all, he was going to show what levitation is and how it works. And he had you know, all of the machines, equipment of such a good university at his disposal. Ultra ultraviolet cameras, infrared cameras, you know, high speed cameras, whatever. So if there was any funny business, they should be able to see that so easily. And if it worked, they'd have proof for, the, for generations to come. So this physicist, he came into the hall carrying a flower pot. One of those flower pots, say. No strings, put it on the lecture table. And then he did something a bit strange. He said, in order to levitate this flower pot, I need your cooperation. And these weren't students, they weren't Sri Lankan Buddhists, or Sydney Buddhists, or any old Buddhists. These were just scientists, lecturers, professors. He said, what I need you to do was to all of you start chanting the uh, Hindu holy word, Om. And all these old professors, and young professors too, all started chanting Om, 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 Om. If I were, I see the nuns in the front smiling. If I was there, I would have laughed. <laughs> but with all these old professors starting chanting Om, the flower pot levitated. It rose up in the air. It lifted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was photographed, videoed. It actually happened. Then afterwards, it's always great to have Q&A. Afterwards, he asked, well, what do you think of that? And there was two professors, well, physicists, experimenters. They said it never rose in the air at all. They said it was always on the table. It never moved an inch. They said, well, look, everyone else saw it. We got videos. No, that's just fake. It never moved. And that's when he said that was the whole purpose of the experiment. It was nothing to do with levitation, but everything about perception. It did actually rise. And the reason it rose was because underneath the table there was a huge electromagnet. And any of you would know if you turn on the amount of current necessary to charge up that electromagnet to lift a heavy flower pot, that's a lot of current. And when you turn on a lot of current, very quickly you can hear the hum of it. Mm. <laughs> the ohm, ohm, ohm was a trick to mask the sound of the current. Otherwise, it had been busted straight away. But nevertheless, the purpose of the experiment was it lifted. But because that was an impossibility, it couldn't happen. It would challenge your perceptions to their very depth. Because of that, they couldn't even perceive it. That's the trouble with what we think is true with our views. If it's too challenging for us, we won't even be able to see it. Even Albert Einstein, you know, he was famous for having this big argument 
with Niels Bohr, another uh, Nobel laureate who was one of the founders of quantum theory. He said, no, it can't be true. Even Einstein couldn't accept that. One of these other fellows I knew over in Cambridge, he got a Nobel Prize eventually for discovering quantum tunneling. He got his Nobel Prize and everybody else thought, that's nonsense, that doesn't work, you can't do that, it's impossible. It took him about six or seven years to actually to convince people to try it, to test it out. And it was correct. He got a Nobel Prize for that. One of the reasons why I like mentioning that story is that particular guy, he got his breakthrough understanding how quantum tunneling worked after meditating. His meditation gave him the clarity of the mind. That's one of the reasons why the power of stillness allows you to subdue this wanting, this ill will, the sloth and torpor for goodness. Why are people so tired? I mentioned I was tired this afternoon when I crossed my leg. I didn't cross my leg. Yeah, I did cross my legs and started meditating. But then you stay there. I know that the energy builds and builds and builds and builds. That's the power of stillness. And eventually, just, you know, your sleepiness, dullness vanishes. And you get empowered. But not empowered with, like, the restlessness. And have you ever been there? You can't just stay still, you know, just want some water. No, I don't want water. What do I want? I don't know what I want. That restlessness is like energy which is not focused. But when there's five hindrances are gone, there's four hindrances have gone there, there's one hindrance that's yet to go. The doubt. And honestly, that took me years to understand what doubt was. How do you understand that what you are experiencing is actually true, the power of stillness, to actually overcome the doubt? I, told, I was just telling the story to the monks last uh, every serpentine on Wednesday, gave a talk, they wanted me to talk about doubt. Years ago, over in Bodhinyana Monastery, meditating. I didn't have too much responsibility there. Get some loving meditations. And after one of the meditations, I just decided just to try something I'd never done before. What I tried was asking myself the simple question, what is my earliest memory? You got a nice meditation, very clear mind, lots of energy, but focused. What is my earliest memory? And what I came into my mind almost immediately after that question is that my mind was just so obedient. I don't know if you've ever had a dog which has been well trained. Go and fetch my slippers and it goes over there wagging its tails and brings the slippers back to you. That's what my mind was like. What's my earliest memory? And the memory which came up was me as a baby in my mother's pram. Remember that word pram? In the old fashioned, you put the baby in there and you can wheel them all over the place. Interesting thing, I don't forget this, I'm not making this up. I was back in my pram, I was maybe a three or four weeks old kid, being wheeled around somewhere. But you can remember the, the colours of the, uh, the blanket or whatever, it was only just black and white, there was no colour at all. It was just after the Second World War, so everyone was quite poor. But I still also remember my favourite toy. That was a three or four week old kid, which was a little light blue pig, ceramic which had some beans in it or something, my mother would shake it and make me laugh. Clear memories of years and years and years ago when I didn't think that you could have a developed memory. 
And the other thing which I recall from that experience, which was weird, was that I recognized my mother and also my pram, my blanket, my pillow, my little pig, by how it smelt. My nose was the dominant sense, not what she looked like, not what the pram looked like, not what they sounded like, or how they felt, but how they smelt. And that was so strong. And when I told some other doctors about that, there's probably a few doctors here as well, I hope, you will understand that that is actually how babies develop. It's the sense of smell that's dominant. And I know that as an experience, not studying uh, sort of the sensory development of the human brain. And that was weird. So that happened in the meditation, through stillness. But the weird part of that, the most weird part of that, I never needed to check it out. Because you had the feeling, the knowledge, this was real. Basically, there was no doubt at all. And for years, I wondered, this is a weird experience, but that's how it felt. It was only years later when you stupid Ajahn Brahm, you made the connection. This is what it feels like when the doubt is extinguished. You know, just as a result of the meditation. Whatever you see, whatever you feel, whatever you know, it's true. As a result, this is how the Buddha taught. This is the power of stillness. I should actually just go and say a few word, words about this. That I call it stillness. I know that many people call it concentration. And I will argue to midnight and beyond, not just today, the next day at all, that that is a very bad translation, bad in many ways not accurate according to the Pali, and also quite an obstacle to developing meditation. I don't know how many people you're going to come for the meditation day tomorrow. Imagine if we call this developing concentration, then tomorrow will be a concentration camp. <laughs> how many would come? <laughs> I wouldn't. It's not, con it's stillness. I know many of you have seen this before, but here it comes again. What is meditation? Which gives rise to this you know, beautiful absence of doubt. What you see, what you hear, what you know, you're 100% sure of. The water represents my mind. My job is not to concentrate my mind, to bring it to stillness. How do I get this water to be perfectly still? Has it stopped moving yet? Of course not, I'm not mindful, am I? I will now be mindful. <laughs> Please don't make me laugh. I'll be mindful. Has it stopped moving yet? So now I'll concentrate. And I'm not m making this up. I try to keep this water still, mindful, concentrating. I've never been able to do it. You can try this for hours at home if you like. You just get a tired arm and you'll think you can't meditate. It's such an obvious, easy way to get this water to be perfectly still, effortlessly still. Put it down. Let go. Renounce. Stop attaching. Leave it alone. Let it be. Renounce. Wow. That water is amazingly still now. Easy. I can keep it like that for a long time. 
That's how to meditate. If you watch your mind, aware of it, and be careful not to interfere with it. Leave it alone. Be kind. Be aware. That kindfulness will eventually bring your mind to a state of stillness. How Ajahn Chah would describe it, he said it was like the leaves and the bushes, leaves on the trees, they only move because the wind blows. If the wind stopped blowing, the leaves would still move, but less and less and less, until all of their momentum would be used up through friction. And then they become perfectly still. Why? Because that's their default state. That's their natural way of existing. They become perfectly still. And when it gets still, the power of stillness is immense. Not only does it energize you, but you also find some other weird experiences happen. Again, I was always adventurous as a young man. I remember as a student, I went to a Zen monastery to do a weekend retreat. The only reason I went there, I must admit, was because there was hardly any other places to go and do a, a meditation retreat in those days. And I was in the north of England in a meditation retreat, in Throstle Hole, it was called. I had no experience of Zen meditation. What I was told was you sit down, eyes open, and stare at a wall, a whitewashed wall. I was quite obedient, mostly just because I was interested to try something out, to experience, to explore. So I did what they were told me to do, my eyes wide open, sitting there for 45 minutes, staring at a whitewashed wall. I must say, I would been meditating, you know, in the Samatha tradition for a couple of years, so at least I knew how to focus my mind and keep it still, without thoughts. That was important. So I was sitting there, just watching a whitewashed wall. Soon became quite still. And then, the wall vanished. Weird experience. It's like you're seeing me, and then suddenly, poof, I'm gone. Just not there anymore. That's weird. And I never thought this was something supernatural, but it was close enough an old wall of a barn was suddenly there and then suddenly gone the next moment. No wall there at all. And I wasn't taking drugs. I wasn't crazy. I was a theoretical physicist. So what I did was try and explore it. Why? It soon became very, very obvious to me. For those of you who want to prove this to yourself, just for maybe one minute, close your eyes. What do you see? When I first close my eyes, I see the inside of my eyelids. Because that doesn't really excite my brain, after a few seconds, I don't see anything at all. The sense of sight becomes turned off. You can open your eyes again if you wish. That's all what's happening. Because there's a whitewashed wall, simple, not interesting. It was like your computer. If you don't click a mouse or do anything, the screen saver turns the screen off. That's how your brain works. Through stillness, things vanish. You know, when I started explaining this, when I was teaching in Singapore a few years ago, I had enough of a reputation. We did a half an hour at lunchtime for executives. And I told them to sit down, a few instructions, but enough. Close your eyes, 
you know, start being still, mindfulness and kindness, and after a while, parts of their body started to vanish. <laughs> because these were executives, they were mindful, they had energy, and they had enough confidence to follow what I was saying. And they started complaining afterwards, Ajahn Brahm, I was sitting down there, and my hands vanished. They couldn't feel them. Wonderful! What's wrong with that? <laughs> but it scared them. They never experienced that before. Through stillness, parts of your body vanish. What a beautiful thing that is. Okay, now another really nice deep story. I'm usually, actually not usually, but basically all the time exceptionally healthy. I don't know why, but honestly, when you see someone like an Ajahn Brahmali, ask him, Ajahn Brahm, how's his health? Other people get sick. I tend not to. I never had COVID. I haven't had anything for years. The last time I went to a hospital you know, to get a checkup was 32 years ago. <laughs> I won't say how I remember that, but nevertheless, <laughs> I'm pretty healthy. How come? The first year as a monk, I did get sick. I didn't know what it was. A lot of the monks in this monastery in the northeast of Thailand were getting a similar sickness. The local doctors thought it was typhoid. It was actually scrub typhus. It, you know, similar symptoms, so very heavy fever, but it was the scrub typhus was caused by these little mites in the forest floor. The difficulty was the locals in that area had grown a natural immunity to that disease over many generations. And when the Westerners came in, you know, we got it pretty quickly. You know, by meditating on the floor, or sometimes sleeping out in the forest. So when I got scrub typhus, very heavy fevers, put into the hospital in Ubon Rajatani Hospital. This was in 1974 or five or something. A long time ago, at that time, Thailand was a third world country and the northeast of Thailand was the backwaters of the third world country. So there wasn't really that good medical treatment there. In fact, I remember just, this was almost traumatized into my memory, that just when I first went there in a ward with maybe six monks on one side, six monks on the other side, the toddler to the very end, and just at 6 p.m., the nurse at the front station just disappeared. And I asked one of the other monks, should we alert people? There's no nurse at night. The night nurse hasn't turned up. And he said, what do you mean night nurse? There never is a night nurse in this hospital. If you get sick at night, it's just unfortunate karma, that's all. And that's true, I'm not <laughs> making that up. And the treatment there was just a cocktail of antibiotics, hoping that one would work twice a day. You know that we always, even in those days, we're supposed to have lots of loving kindness to all these people who try to heal you. But the nurse, the nurse who'd inject these antibiotics, this was almost 50 years ago. They didn't have recycled needles in those days. No, just one-use needles in those days. All the needles were recycled. You know, they boiled them up to try and uh, take all the uh, bugs off them before they'd inject you. And they've been used many, many times. Especially for monks, we're supposed to be the tough guys. So I think they used them extra on the monks. And this nurse, you know, you may always, any Thai people here from Thailand? Okay, I don't think you'd mind that much, but this Thai lady, you know, she wasn't beautiful at all. She was like a water buffalo. 
you know, you'd always think that you know, Thai nurses are petite and pretty. Not this one. She had to be strong. The, re the reason was, she never injects you. you know, turn on your front, bang! Stabbed me. Twice a day. And after a week of that, I think it was about three or four weeks I was there uh, getting stabbed, your butt was so sore. <laughs> you had no energy, and everything was just really awful. The most, I was only 24 or 5 or something. I've never felt so weak in my life. No energy. One day, even Ajahn Chah came in to see me. And the great master, Ajahn Chah, as, as soon as he comes in, you think, oh, he's coming to see me? Wow! He was so inspiring, but his bedside manner was awful. He just came in, looked at me and said, Brahma Wangso, you're either going to get better or you're going to die. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> he actually said that. <laughs> the worst part about it, you can't argue with that, can you? That's absolute truth. You're either going to get better or you're going to die. That's not what I want to hear. <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, after that, there are some times I've found in my life but sometimes when your back is against the wall, there's nothing you can do, you can't stand it any longer. Sometimes that you decide to meditate, to go for stillness. And I did that. Just about three weeks in hospital. I cannot remember I was actually in a fever when I did this or out of it, but I felt just really terrible and no energy. And my posture at the time, I always remember the posture. I've never seen any meditation posture like this in any book ever. One leg was this way, one leg was that way, an arm over here, an arm over there. <laughs> That's what my body wanted, so I let it do it. Got this amazing deep meditation, which was gorgeous. You can imagine just when you have a nice peaceful, or even just a peaceful meditation compared to having been under a fever for three weeks. Imagine the, sort of the contrast was immense. And I just enjoyed that so much. The power of stillness. And of course, that's when you start to recover. And it's also that it doesn't matter how weak you are, you know, even you're really, really sick, you can always do stillness. And the results are impressive. Sicknesses go. I've been experimenting and teaching this to so many people for so many years. And it was just, I don't know if he's here this evening, I doubt it. But many, many years ago, I was teaching a meditation retreat over in Wat Buddha Dhamma. You know that place over in uh, three mile, yeah, not three mile hollow, but thirty mile hollow or something. Wiseman's Ferry, yeah, up north there, yeah. And anyway, teaching this meditation retreat there, and the first day, in the question and answer time, had all these complaints, all the same, and no, but people put them on pieces of paper. Ajahn Brahm, can you please ask people to breathe quietly? <laughs> and then I actually explained, the person who was making all the noise when he was breathing, he had a sinus cancer, this big tumour in the bridge of his nose. He could not breathe through his nose, it's only through his mouth. And when he told me the first day of the retreat, he said, look, I'm not even a Buddhist, but just, you know, in case meditation can work. You know, I've just come on your retreat. And the doctors have given up on me. They've tried all sorts of treatment, but this tumour up his nose was stopping him breathing. One thing I was really proud of, all the people on that retreat, as soon as I mentioned the reason it was 
making such a noise breathing because he was dying of sinus cancer. No one ever complained anymore. They gave him so much kindness. I was very proud and uplifted by the attitude of people afterwards once they found out what was really going on. But anyway, he carried on for nine days, meditating. Nothing happened. And I was already packed up in the car, waiting to go to the airport to go back to Perth. When he came running after me, I said, Mama, Mama, please wait for a few moments. I think you know what the traffic is like, getting over the ferry and just getting to the airport. I was really concerned if I'd make it in time. But I said, yeah, well, what's going on? We waited a few moments. And he said, on the very, very, very last meditation, it always happens on the last meditation. I'll say more about that tomorrow. But the last meditation, he was sitting there quietly, same old, same old. Then he heard a popping sound. I always remember the way he said it. Something pop. And he could breathe through his nose. But only for one minute. And then it closed up again. That's why I was so excited. I need to tell you this. It's closed up again now. But for one minute, it had opened up. And honestly, I thought he'd left it too late. He was going to die. I wish him the best of luck. And he said he'll carry on, see what happens. And it was six months later, roughly, at another place here in Sydney, this guy came up to me and said, do you remember me? <laughs> Please don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to upset you, but you know, sometimes you give big talks to so many thousands of people, and say, of course I can't remember you. And I was honest with him, I said, I don't know I remember you, who the hell are you? <laughs> and that's when he said, I was that guy. I was the one who was shocked. He said, I carried on meditating as you instructed us. And the tumor popped many times. It's now totally gone. Thank you. That's gorgeous. That's like the power of stillness. How it happens, it's happened so many times. I've seen anyway in my life. It'd be wonderful if someone can actually do some proper research this is saving people's lives. The power of stillness doesn't work for everybody, but just to save one or two lives. Isn't that really amazing? Passing exams without any stress. Getting re oh, I didn't mention, I did, because uh, that guy Moshe Bernstein, he invited me to his school. It was a local... Uh, the local Jewish school in Perth. They only got one Jewish school, just for Jewish children, boys and girls. He invited me to teach there because, you know, they were doing really, really badly in the year 12s. And he said, you know, can you come and see what you can do? I like mentioning the story because honestly, I went there for the day, taught all the year 12s how to do exams by doing this meditation. And then I got this wonderful letter from the principal afterwards. And he said, thank you so much, Ajahn Brahm. This year we became the top school in all the schools in Western Australia. It worked. What I can't figure out is why they never invited me again. <laughs> it makes no sense. But anyway, it does actually work. And you just see these you know, people getting... Uh, over their sinus cancers and other cancers and other diseases. That's only like a, a small thing. But getting like the wisdom and understanding you know, the nature of things, going over doubt, you pass lives. It'd be nice to know for sure do past lives exist or do they not exist? And you can do that. You don't have to do it intellectually or just believe because you have confidence and faith you know, in Ajahn Brahm or one of the great nuns sitting in front of me. 
You can see that for yourself, without doubt. Not because you're just easy believing stuff. This is something much, much different. That comes from the power of stillness. Has many, many different aspects to it. But I've spoken enough. Now I want to open up the opportunity for Q and A, questions and answers. So up to now, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Okay, well, interesting times. If anyone has any questions, please put up your hand and we do have someone who will come over with a roaming mic um, if you have any questions. And for those who are online, you are welcome to put any questions that you have into the chat. Anyone, yeah, anyone who needs to go to the letting go room, You've been sitting down here so well behaved. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a question online. Okay. Um, this Go. is the question. How to follow the third precept of sexual misconduct? Is it only for married people who can have sex? What about in or outside of a committed relationship? How does Buddhism view consensual polyamorous relationship? Do they, who are in polyamorous relationships, break the third precept? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for the enlightenment. You know, the third precept is a fascinating one to actually to look into deeply. One of the reasons why is that uh, that precept has different um, ways of practice in different countries. Things which are allowed to do in one country, not allowed in another. But nevertheless, what's underneath all of that? Now, how do we understand any precept? For many people in Australia, they always say, oh, five precepts is too much. So I tell them just to keep two precepts. I say this because, you know, there's many funny stories about precepts. When I was in Thailand, after being in Australia for a while, I saw many people taking the precepts, you know, par, nati, par, to wherever how many. They usually put your hand up. That's how you're supposed to take the precepts, with your hand up. I saw one person doing this. <laughs> I'd never seen that before. <laughs> so I asked them, why have you got one finger down? I'm only keeping four precepts down. <laughs> And that made me interested. I started looking. See a few people with two. <laughs> no, it's, keep it properly. Even also, that's for Thai Buddhists, Sri Lankan Buddhists. I asked people, how many precepts are you keeping today? It was like a waste that day. And I said, we're keeping 13 precepts today. How many of you have heard of the 13 precepts? I hadn't heard of that before, so I said, what is it? Well, we keep eight precepts in the morning and five precepts in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> those of you who don't know, the most important of the eighth precept is not eating anything in the afternoon. So you just keep that eight precepts in the morning time. <laughs> You're not losing out at all. <laughs> Sounds crazy. But no, to make it clearer, I ask people, just keep two precepts. Not doing anything which harms another human, another being. And the second precept, don't do anything which harms yourself. And from that you can derive every precept that ever was, or will be. Don't be harmful to yourself or others. I taught that to a group of school kids who were visiting our centre in Perth about 40 years ago. And I said, these are the basic precepts. What does that actually mean? And they got all the five precepts within about 10 minutes. They knew how drinking alcohol would hurt their relationship and hurt people. They'd do stupid things and driving cars and getting into trouble. They knew about if you have you know, more than one person in a, a a sensual relationship, 
how that would cause so much confusion to them. They knew just how uh, things like lying, when their friends lied to them, that just was devastating to these little kids, maybe 11 years of age. All those precepts became so obvious to them. Why don't you start with two? Polyamorous relationship. Does that really work? I don't know. For me, anyway, as a st student, having one girlfriend was all I could afford. <laughs> Honest. Even that was a bit much. Thank you, Ajahn. We've got a lot of questions online, but I want to give those who are here in person an opportunity. I think I saw one go up quick over there. Yeah. Um, see? You've only got one first microphone. come, first serve. Um, there's a few also in the audience. We'll come to you shortly. Yeah. Crikey, you can get very fit. <laughs> Hi, Ajahn Brahm. Thank you for the talk. Um, I really loved your book, uh, Karuna, Karuna Virus. Oh yeah. Um, that's been, meant a lot to me, I've been reading that. And I particularly love the one about, the first chapter in it, about the, um, uh, the temple burning down and your way to let go. Um, yes. I'm wondering about, uh, I struggle with like extreme emotions and I'm wondering like how to sit with those emotions because I try and kind of meditate on them and I have a problem with eating a lot of sugary foods which then doesn't help and that kind of is my way of coping with strong i mean even positive emotions really i just don't know how and i find it hard to kind of meditate and sit on this really strong any kind of emotion good so please first of all know the emotions first of all understand them learn them i know this is a sort of book which maybe you think a monk shouldn't read and it's the Chinese art of war. Know your enemy, know yourself. A thousand battles fought, a thousand battles won. But that they know, what are these emotions? So to do that you have to be with them for a while and get to understand them. Otherwise they're enemies which you don't know. And of course you will always lose. Of that, please make a separation between the, the positive emotions and the negative ones. Positive emotions, have you ever seen Ajahn Brahm cry? Did you see me cry? You have? Oh, okay, yeah. No, there are two places in this world which I always cry. And one of those is the Vulture's Peak up in India. I think, Venerable I think you were there with me a few times in India. Maybe if you can remember that. But when I went up to the Vulture's Peak, that was where the Buddha would meditate. And you could just go into the same cave and just sit down. You didn't have to pay anything, there was hardly anybody there. And you know, the energy, the vibes, if you like, were just so strong there. Just the tears came to my eyes. And the other place where I cry, we went to, I was always wanted to see the beautiful, oh, we haven't got one here, the beautiful Dhammachaka Buddha statue. It was uh, found in uh, Sanat outside of Benares in the old deer park. I'd seen that on photographs and I always thought it was one of the most beautiful Buddha statues in the world. And one day I went there and I tried to find it in the museum. And there was no sort of guidance or any, anything. I just turned around one corner and there it was at the end of the passage. <laughs> It was so beautiful. It wasn't crying out of any negative emotions. 
It was something which the Buddha described as piti, this great sense of joy and happiness which sometimes comes up in meditation, pure inspiration. And the next time I took the disciples there who were following me on pilgrimage, I said, look, you know, this is what happened to me the last time, but I'm restrained this time. So we turned around the corner. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> it was just joy seeing something beautiful. I don't know if there are any mathematicians here, but you know, sometimes I confess this, getting into things like pure maths, and sometimes you see a proof of something. And the proof was actually so beautiful, so inspiring. You know, tears came to my eyes, real tears, out of joy. It's inspiring sometimes. Sometimes you've seen monks give beautiful talks and tears have come to your eyes. There were times, the third time I went to see the Buddha statue outside of Benares, this time I had my pocket full of tissues. <laughs> and I told everybody, look, I can't help myself. It's just an automatic response. It was not negative, it was just beautiful, inspirational. When we turn the corner, this is what happens when you have expectations. They were doing some renovations. They had the Buddha statue covered with a big tarpaulin. I come all that way, all the way from Australia and then eventually to Benares in India and Sana in the museum, found my way there and it was all covered with a tarpaulin. And I was ready to just feel so much joy and instead I felt all this disappointment. Oh. And I can't speak any of the local language, Hindi or whatever it was. But nevertheless, I looked at the workman and without saying anything between us, he took the tarpaulin off. <laughs> it, was, it was tears of joy and happiness. Those sorts of emotions, don't try and control them. They are beautiful and very, very positive and helpful part of the path. The negative emotions, see if you can understand, don't try and get rid of them, get to know them, understand them. Why? And if you really want, if they're causing you any problem at all, please follow the simile of the monster in the Emperor's Palace simile. You know that simile? Okay, this is one of the famous ones based on something the Buddha said, and sort of amplified. So once there was this nice young man who came to a talk in Paramatta one evening. No one knew that he was a big, powerful emperor. And while he was here, listening to a talk, in his palace, he found out a, a big monster came in. And this monster was so ugly, frightening, and smelly, and violent, that all the guards, they froze in terror, allowing this monster to walk right into the palace, into the throne room, and sit on the emperor's chair. And at that, the security said, that's going too far. Get out of here. And those few unkind words, unkind deeds, even unkind thoughts, that monster just grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more smelly, more offensive. And by the time the emperor came back, this monster was huge. It was so ugly. Not even Steven Spielberg could get something so ugly in, in Hollywood. And the smell coming off this monster the smell, the smell coming off this monster was so bad, even the maggots crawling on its skin threw up. They barfed. <laughs> but the reason why the guy was... <laughs> Have you ever seen maggots barf? 
<laughs> they couldn't even speak. <laughs> anyway, the reason why the guy was the, the emperor, because he was smart. He knew exactly what to do. He said, welcome. Thank you for coming to visit me. Has anyone got your glass of water or a drink to add some tea? How about some coffee? We've got some good coffee in Sydney. And of those few sincere, kind words, the monster grew even two inch smaller. Less smelly, less offensive, less violent, less angry. And at that, all the people working in the palace knew exactly their mistake. They knew what to do. They rang out, would you like something to eat, a pizza? Because they've got monster pizzas in some of these. Uh, <laughs> do you have monster pizzas, pizza hut here in Sydney? Anyway, they did have him in Perth. Do you want a sandwich? A deviled ham. It's appropriate for a monster. <laughs> some of them gave him a foot massage. About ten of them, he had such big feet. Some of them gave him, sh do you ever have shoulder massages? This monster had such a huge head to actually to give it a massage. Oh, that was really nice. In every act of kindness, the monster kept growing smaller, less ugly, less smelly, less offensive. Until soon that monster was so small, one more act of kindness and the monster vanished completely away. And that's in the Yaka Samyutta, in the Samyutta Nikaya. The pizza and the foot massage, I added those. <laughs> but the Buddha actually called that an anger-eating demon. You can actually find many anger-eating monsters in your life. Sometimes those negative emotions, you give them anger, get out of here, I don't want you in here. They become worse. Welcome them. Learn from them. Once you've learned from them, that's when they vanish. Sorry for giving such a long answer to a short question. But that's my nature. That was an excellent answer, Ajahn, and an excellent question as well. Good, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions online, so I'll start with the first one. Hi, Ajahn Brahm, my apologies. What was the point about talking about that person who won the Nobel Prize, using stillness via meditation to get that energy or inspiration? What he did, he, get, he got that uh, inspiration to be able to see things in a totally different way. So many times in universities, I'm speaking in a university now, we think in just narrow lines. We don't think outside of the box. We're trained to think in a certain way. And sometimes when you meditate, all those old habits of thinking disappear. You can get what we call insight. See things in different ways not just in the same old way. Why is it when this is great breakthroughs in knowledge, in wisdom, why is it that most people just don't accept it? They say, no, it's wrong. Why is that? So this particular person, now he'd been working on this for such a long time, and then just meditating, that stillness of the mind, the power of that stillness, you can just see that a little bit extra in a different way. They used to say, I remember going over to Canada once, and one of the disciples of the wonderful Sri Lankan lady who was doing some amazing research, and so she was so well respected. She told me to go and have a cup of tea with the Chancellor of Dalhousie University. And so when I was there, I you know, said, he was a physicist as well, and I said one of the problems with universities is you know, some of the mottos are just, you know, really should be changed. I don't know what the motto of this place is, but I said, why not change it to where everybody thinks the same, no one thinks at all. 
And that's the trouble with science. That's the trouble with politics too. It's the trouble with many of our endeavours. Medicine. Too many people are thinking the same. And no one is challenging, no one is seeing deeper. So that's my answer. If it's up to me, carry on. I'm energised. Wonderful, okay. So I was just asking Ajahn if he would like to stop or if he would like to continue on. So yeah, if anyone needs to move, uh, go home because they, may, they thought it's going to stop at nine o'clock, then fine. Thank but you, There's a question over there. Yes. Um, thanks, Ajahn. I can't resist because we're in a university. Um, what, what would you say to people that believe that the mind is the brain? Oh. Okay, Stephen Hawkins is one of those. And I mentioned him the other day. Because this guy Bernard, he's a good friend, and he was a close collaborator of Stephen. And he could never convince Stephen Hawkins that... Uh, the mind is totally different than the brain. You do need a mind, even for you know, quantum theory, to do anything. You do need something separate, who can observe phenomena, experience phenomena. Even in science, I know that much, the mind is totally independent. And even recently, years ago, in 1981, uh, I remember this uh, John Lorber, L-O-R-B-E-R, who wrote this article about the boy with no brain. He didn't have a brain. And the reason it was found out, he was doing research on the shape of human skulls. And if there was any skull which was slightly mis mis um, malformed, slightly strange, he wanted to find out whether that had any influence on your intelligence or even your emotional intelligence. And he'd invite all these students who had a slightly malformed skull, so not brain skull, and if they agreed, they would do a little research. One of them was a CT scan. And this one boy, he was a graduate student in mathematics. He'd always got his first degree, he was doing his second degree. He had a girlfriend, he was just, you see him, he looked an average, actually better than average kid. But when they gave him a CT scan, they found he didn't have a brain. 99% of what would be a brain was uh, the fluid, intracranial fluid. I forget what the name is now. Only 1% cortex, which is no way in the world could that explain any higher brain function, like language. I remember just to that retreat where that guy had um, the sinus cancer, I was taken there by a doctor who was a Buddhist and we discussed this on the way to the retreat and he said he'd seen that CT scan, it was redone just to make sure that the first um, CT scan wasn't in error, it's real, so what happened to it? And he said it was put in a back, uh, in a back uh, filing cabinet, treated as an anomaly. In other words, it shouldn't happen, but it did. And only recently, about four years ago, uh, some of the monks, they managed to find another person who had 90% cortex, the rest was intracranial fluid. He too should not have any higher uh, brain functions. But he's still living a nice life. It was just showing that the brain could not account for those uh, those phenomena. So sometimes I don't know why people can't see the obvious. That for many, oh, other things, terminal lucidity, which is another term. When I was in Singapore. Uh, giving uh, some lectures uh, at the palliative care unit. 
and asking there how many of you nurses and doctors have seen for yourself with your own eyes terminal lucidity. You know what that means? I'm kind of disappointed you don't know what that means. Terminal lucidity is the phenomenon when somebody is very close to death, they may be even in a coma, they may be have dementia, the last few minutes of their life, they open their eyes, they can remember everybody. The coma is gone and they say, oh nice to see you, where have you been? They talk to each other as if they've got total control over their nervous system and their brain, but their brain is not there anymore, it's dead, it's gone. It's called terminal lucidity. And about a third of the doctors and nurses at this unit said they'd experienced it. One of the stories of one of the doctors over in Perth, because when I made this story, he put his hand up and said, yeah, it happened to me last week. One of his patients, had been in sort of a coma for a day or two, that you know, he started the dying process. You know, any doctor and nurses know that death is not a moment, but it's a whole process. And the instructions from this patient was, I'm leaving all my uh, loved ones, the addresses, their telephone numbers, emails, whatever, in this little book next to my bed. If anything happens, give them a call. So once the dying process started, he started ringing up all the close relations. And he started ringing them up one after the other, and he got to this guy's daughter, Julie. And as he, Julie answered, Julie, I'm sorry to say, your father is dying, please come now. And then this guy just opened his eyes, turned around and said, please tell Julie how much I love her. And those were his last words and died. It's supposed to be totally impossible. At that point, his brain was basically not functioning anymore. Terminal lucidity. That is where the brain is not functioning, the mind takes over. Or kids. Just how many of you had a child and when they were just you know, a few weeks old could actually speak? Be honest. The first time that happened was these couple of these parents. They were not Buddhist. They were just Aussie parents. Had two kids, Peter and Paul. Those are the names I remember. And they came to see us. They said, we're not Buddhist. We only come to see you because we think you may take us seriously, not ridicule us. Because what happened when the new kid came back from hospital after being born, still in a pram, or whatever it is called, and said to the older kid, sort of, Paul, please say, that's right, uh, Peter, please go and say good night to your brother Paul, still in the, only a couple of weeks old. Go and say good night to your younger brother. So he went up to the pram and leaned over and said to his baby brother, Good night, Paul, as kids do. But then Paul said, Good night, Peter. If that happened to you, what would you do? Well, this couple of parents did. They were shocked. Did we imagine this? And they just turned and stared in disbelief. And their older son, only a couple of years old, three years old or something, said again, good night, Paul. And this time with both of them paying full attention, said good night, said the, the baby said good night, Peter. And the fascinating part of that, they said without you know, any prompting from us, Ajahn Jakwa was there at the time, without any prompting they said, he said this in an adult voice, not in baby voice, but it came from his mouth. How could that ever happen? Now this, 
that was a personal experience, they told us face to face. I know another Malaysian couple, similar experience, they decided not to tell anybody because they thought they'd be ridiculed. And there was one of my favourite ones, I'd love to have this justified, I just saw this in an article and it kind of made a lot of sense to me. This uh, in the United States somewhere, in maternity ward, kid came out of the womb, just looked around and spoke. The words he said, just straight out of the womb, said, oh no, not again. <laughs> I wanted to lighten it up a bit, but that's true, that's what I, was, I heard. So that's actually, the only way to explain that is that's the mind controlling the speech, not the brain. The brain hasn't developed enough yet. Mind can. Thank you, Ajahn. A question from online. Hi, Ajahn. How do we sit still if sitting seems very difficult at the moment because of very, a very restless mind, because of outside problems? Is there anything we can do about this? Excellent. When you learn how to sit still no matter what, you rest, you are not one of the problems anymore, and you have insight into solving those problems. And you can do that reasonably easy. One of the things which you know, I do, a little trick if you like, is you know, if ever I'm in a very noisy place, uh, so I've decided to meditate in the middle of the town once. It was many years ago, the Burmese Buddhist community were trying to do something peaceful to bring attention to the problems happening in Burma at the time. So they invited me to come and do a two-hour sit on the pavement, opposite one of the, they call it time zone, I think, like a video game storm. It was really loud. And so I thought this would be a nice challenge for me. So I sat down there for two hours. I imagined a bubble around myself. Inside that bubble was my space. And everything else was outside. And what happens after a while when you really start to, f to focus inside and start to become still, it's like all those sounds become distant from you. Like a long, long way away, even though they're right next to you. And after that phenomena comes, you know, they can actually turn off from those sounds. So, and it's worth it to see the value in it, first of all. Something I haven't mentioned yet, but hopefully you've heard of this before, that is called an investment in time. When you're working, do you have enough time to do all the jobs? If you don't, it means you're wasting time. That's why you don't have enough time. What do you mean by wasting time? Maybe you may have seen your kids. They're supposed to be doing some um, work for school, some project. You see them at their computer and they are not actually doing very much. The sentences don't come out, the ideas don't come out. The paragraphs take forever to complete. Have you felt like that too? you've got some job to do and why is it taking so long? It's because your mind is not ready to do that job. Instead of just pushing yourself in front of the computer, forcing yourself to work, it'd be much better to either take a rest, go for a walk, or best of all, sit down and meditate. You get your energy back again, like I said at the beginning. And then what happens, 15 minutes, of just meditation, right in the middle of a lot of work. Stop it, be peaceful, don't waste those 15 minutes, don't think of the work. Just imagine you're in your little cave. Get your mind to be really, really peaceful. Then when you come out of your meditation, you find that you are energized, clear, whatever work you do, you can do with greater efficiency. 
I know that I sometimes I have to write emails, sometimes I don't write those emails. If I don't write those emails, Hi Karunika, it's because I'm too tired. So I'll meditate, I'll write them eventually. And I don't mean I'm just putting it off. I want to make sure that you don't waste time. You wait and then you, after you've meditated, you write, say, an email or write some essay, you find you do that in such a short amount of time. And it's high quality. To remind myself of that, you know that first book which I wrote? Opening the Door of Your Heart? You seen that one? That book, the first half of that I did when I was on a personal retreat. Just one hour. One hour a day. The rest of the day I was meditating. I said, I'm going to do one hour a day just writing it out. By hand, not printing it out on a computer. I didn't have a computer at that time. I did half the book in 13 sessions. And I still got the original manuscript. It's in my room. I'm sorry, Fennel Kroenig, I won't auction that. Because that is just, I use that to, to basically to bliss myself out. I look at that. There's no mistakes in it. Just really nice handwriting. People say, what font is that? They haven't seen that font on any computer. It's just handwriting. And I look at that. How on earth do you do that? Many, many pages. It took such a short amount of time, because it was after I was meditating. Just the ideas come out, you just get in that zone, you just write it. That's how you can perform to such incredibly high level such a short time with no stress. That's why I know when I did go and visit Mountain, Mountain View in San Fran, you know, the Silicon Valley place, went into Google headquarters. They have a meditation room, which they let me sit in. So was um, Facebook. Facebook, their address, they got a big campus there, so their own road, and it was their address is postal address, number one hacker drive. They call it hacker drive. <laughs> That's Facebook postal address. No one ever sends anything there. But if we're going there, also they have a, a meditation room. And they do that because just 15 minutes or half an hour being still. Uh, you come out afterwards, you get new ideas, and your mind is ready to create sentences, ideas, reports, really quickly. Trouble is these days, we waste too much time. Productivity and innovation are just not there anymore. We're just too tired. If I was a CEO, I'd insist that you meditate. Company's time. But meditate properly. You get much more out of your workers. It's called exploitation. <laughs> but in a good way. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, question from the crowd. This. Hi, Ajahn. Um, my friend who's sitting next to me and I, we, we try very hard to practice the precept of not killing, but unfortunately we live in a place that's full of cockroaches. And the other night my friend found me killing some and insisted that it would bring me very bad karma. So I want to know if the Buddha lived with us, what would he do? <laughs> What was in there, sorry? Oh, we live in a place full of cockroaches. Cockroaches. And unfortunately, I, I can't resist killing them. No, honestly, if you possibly can, if there was a Buddha there, he'd spend so much loving kindness towards those cockroaches, they wouldn't bother you. And you also understand, what are the cockroaches there for? The cockroaches need water, put water outside for them. They need some sort of food. Make sure that uh, where you live is very, very, very clean. 
we had problem with cockroaches in our kitchen once. And I was very uh, disappointed that one, we were getting on top of them in our kitchen. We had all these amazing ways of capturing them and taking them a long way away. But then one of our anagarikas there, his postulants, decided it wasn't going fast enough. So he decided to ring up for some expert assistance. He rang up the local council. And as soon as their health department, you got cockroaches? He said, well, you better get rid of them or we're going to close you down. And that was a terrible, terrible thing. So we had to get that kitchen sprayed. Otherwise, there'd be no Bodhinyana monastery. But from that time on, every week, we make sure that that kitchen is basically everything taken out and cleaned to the max. We haven't had any problems since. That was many, many, many years ago. Be kind to the cockroaches. They were a special type of cockroaches. Nothing against Germans, but they're called German cockroaches. And they said, especially they come in with um, cardboard. It took more effort to keep that place clean. But ever since we started keeping it clean, no more problems. And it was worth it, spending that extra effort. So those little cockroaches never needed to be threatened. Please talk to little insects. They do understand. I've seen that too many times in my life. Just one of the huts I stayed in over in Bodhinyana, it was one of the A-frame huts. It was right next to an ant mound. And one of our rules, we're not supposed to build huts next to ant mounds, but there's no other place to put it. But I made sure, I was the builder at the time, I made sure that I always avoided the ant mound never put any wood over it and never disturbed it at all. And once I finished that hut, I moved in there. And those ants never ever came into the hut. I cared for them and they cared for me, honestly. And only later on, one of the other people that they drove a tractor over that ant mound, from that day on they started coming in. Well, sorry, I've seen that too many times. Even like snakes. You know, the snakes over in China, there's a large number of them. Even in West Australia, even in Santi. Are there many snakes over in Santi? Have they ever harmed anybody? Of course not. Why? If you call in the rangers and get them all captured or something, or killed or poisoned, then they'll attack. If you spend kindness to them, it actually works. I've been a monk now for such a long time, even in Thailand. <laughs> As many times snakes have crawled on you, they've stepped on them, but they never ever harm you. So if you're kind to these beings, the beings are always kind to you. Thank you, Ajahn. Great message. Um, a question from the online audience. In my understanding, stillness is obtained when things become very heavy and dull or when things are very energised in a balanced way. How do we know the difference and are there teachings or practices to move away from a heavy stillness to a light stillness? Thank you. The way to move away from the heavy stillness to the light stillness is take away your striving. Don't try and do it. Let it happen. Is this heavy stillness? This is heavy stillness. Trying to keep it still. Putting it down. I, I, just, I did that for an hour or two. It was very still, very easy when you let things go. The kindness, the gentleness. You know, sometimes when I was a young monk, I wondered where on earth is the, the metta, the kindness in the Eightfold Path. I expect at least one of those eight, you know, Sama, Sama Metta or something. And I couldn't find it. 
It was only later on when I learned my Pali and looked a bit deeper. You find that's right in the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Sama Sankhapa, the three Sankhapas. There's uh, Nekama Sankhapa, Awayapada Sankhapa and Hingsaka Sankhapa. What does Nekama mean? Nekama means letting go, putting it down. Awayapada is used as a synonym for metta. Awayapada literally means non-ill will, but you look how it's used by the Buddha, and it's used as same as metta. And I was just so pleased to see that in the second factor of the Eightfold Path, the middle of the three. That's part of the Eightfold Path, compassion, kindness. The third one is non violence, gentleness, ahingsaka. We knew that from Gandhi's teachings. Non violence. So anyone who's violent in the meditation, like teachers, like Zen teachers who have the Zen stick and whack you if you start uh, nodding, that's not Buddhism to me. So much so that, because I get around, I was in Hong Kong once and chatting with uh, a Chinese monk from mainland China. And he said he was part of a retreat. And in that retreat, this lady was nodding and the Zen master came and whacked her on the back with a Zen stick. You know what happened next? This is honest, this is what he said. That woman got out her mobile phone and called the police. And that Zen teacher was arrested and taken away. <laughs> you can't do that in China. And anyway, I wouldn't want anyone to do that to any one of you here. To me, that's not Buddhism, hitting people on the back with a stick. Is it? No way. Um, well, Karunika, how's it going? Because it's not just about me, because you have to go back as well. Can I continue on, or just... Hi, Naroda. How are you? How are you? We carry on or stop? Okay, the people here. Shall we carry on? Anyone against? Democracy? Okay. Well, no one's left, so that's a good sign. Yeah. Enjoying this, yeah. Oh, there's a question at the back. Someone has to run up fast. Right over there, too. Goodness. There's a kid in the red shirt in the back, too. Questions? Oh. Oh, back there. there. There's a kid at the back. Red shirt. Do you have a question? Yeah. One over there as well. Uh, why did you become a monk? <laughs> why became a monk? Can I give you a true story? <laughs> I started as a theoretical physicist, thinking I could find out the truth of life you know, through science. And I found that there's many things in science troubled me. Too many people were just trying to prove things rather than disprove things. And I just had a girlfriend, I just finished with the girlfriend, and I was at a time in my life, I had a good education, still young, and had the freedom to go over to Asia, become a monk for, for a short time. One of the things I liked about Thai Buddhism, you could become a monk for a short time. So I decided to go to Thailand, ordain. My plan was to go to Thailand for two years, ordain as a monk for two years, become enlightened, and once I'm enlightened, I can come back and carry on, find a nice girlfriend, get married, start a family, and carry on with my career. It was something important I wanted to get out of the way, first of all, getting enlightened. <laughs> 
that's how much I understood about Buddhism. But then when a weird thing happened, or well, after I became a novice monk over in Bangkok, I had nightmares the first three nights I was a novice monk. I woke up in the middle of the night, you know, in terror, a nightmare. But my nightmare was, I thought I was a lay person. And I opened my eyes and saw my robes neatly folded by my bedside. I was a monk. I'd made it. And I felt so happy, I closed my eyes and then fell into a very deep, peaceful sleep. And that happened three times in a row. And it kind of, you know, told me something, that this was something deeper than I ever knew I really, really, really wanted to do. And from that time on, I had no doubts at all. That was my life. And many other times, you can ask Ajahn Sujato this, Many times other monks decided they wanted to disrobe and I would be the last person they came to. Don't go and see Ajahn Bhai, you won't get any sympathy there. <laughs> I love the lifestyle of a monk and also of a nun. It's a beautiful life. And sometimes you can always think of the other side of the fence, oh maybe I can teach better if I'm a lay person. No, you can't. It's such a great inspiration. Are these three nuns inspiring to you? No. <laughs> Are they inspiring? Yes. It's marvellous. These days I sometimes want to come to a university like this uh, just when people are graduating, like a career day. Have you ever considered a career? as a monk or a nun. Now, honestly, just the amount of feedback which I get, the pay is terrible. <laughs> You're exploited to the max. But the job satisfaction is really is out of this world. <laughs> just on the way here in the car, I was saying recently when I was in UK, and we were teaching a retreat only a weekend retreat in Sheffield, in the north of England. Not a big major Buddhist city. And as I was going from the train station to the venue, this guy in a big bulldozer, like a big backhoe, and a big one, working for the council, fixing up the roads. He opened his window and he shouted at me, Hey! You're the spitting image of Ajahn Brahm in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, that's understandable. I am Ajahn Brahm, but not in Australia. I'm in Sheffield today. <laughs> and he stopped his machine. He climbed out of the cab, which was a long way down, stopped all the other workers, had a nice conversation, and then a photo op. <laughs> and he said, I better go back to work. He said otherwise it will be World War Three with the local council. But that gave me so much happiness. He said he listens to those talks on YouTube so often. And he couldn't believe. It's like his teacher, which he only sees on YouTube, is right in front of him on the road in Sheffield on a Saturday morning. He couldn't believe it. So he stopped everything. The amount of joy that gives me is immense. Thank you, Ajahn. And I think I speak from everyone here that the amount of joy that you share with all of us by your presence and your talk tonight. Shall we continue or what do you think? Maybe one more question. One more question. There's one over there, there's one over there. Okay, two more questions. <laughs> I'll let you no, choose. One over there too. Okay, go on. Ajahn, what are your instructions for Vipassana meditation? Vipassana meditation. There's no difference between Vipassana meditation and Samatha meditation. The two go together. Quickly, Ajahn Chah. Can you see the front of my hand? See the back of my hand? Back of my hand is like Vipassana, the front is Samatha, you can't separate them. You might think you're doing Vipassana meditation in the front, Samatha has to be in the back. 
maybe think doing samatha meditation, vipassana has to be right behind it. Sometimes you think you're doing both, on the on side. You cannot split them up. Impossible. If you're coming tomorrow, I can say more about that tomorrow. Second question? One over there, oh, one over here. And one over there, and that'll be the end of it. Hello, um, I have a question, and um, it is about perfectionism. Oh. So I just wanted to know, um, how do you let go of wanting things to follow a certain way? Um, how do you live with ease, oh. is more of the question. Easy. Thank you. I remember teaching this example to people who were clients of the mental health department. And I said, many of you think that you know you don't belong. There's something terribly wrong with you. That you've got this um, disease, that disease, this complaint, you've been diagnosed. One of the worst things, if you're diagnosed with a mental illness or a physical illness or something else, you think you don't belong. And I told this whole class, class of um, clients in a big convention center in Perth, you are like the trees in the forest. I'm a forest monk, I live in the forest, I've seen so many trees. In all the years I've lived in a forest, I've never yet seen a perfect tree. And I don't want them to be perfect. Even people who love trees, like Germans in the Black Forest, they never go in there and straighten up all the bent and twisted trees. Number one, if you are bent and twisted, you belong. Just like every bent and twisted tree has a place in the forest and I don't want them to disappear. If you're bent and twisted, you belong to. And number two, the more bent and twisted you are, the more beautiful you are. All the bent and twisted trees, they're the ones I like to sit under. They are gorgeous. When I said that to these people with mental health diseases, a couple of them came up to apologize to me afterwards. I said, well, you don't need to apologize to me. Yes, we do. He said, because when you first came in, Please excuse the language, this is what they said. When you first came in, I turned around to my friend and I said, who is this wanker coming to teach us? And they didn't know, who. I wasn't wearing a white coat. And they said, but you made us cry and laugh, thank you so much. Trees in a forest, you don't want the forest to look perfect. In fact, it looks much more beautiful when it's not so perfect. If you want, I don't know if you've got a partner in life, but if you have a partner and they're perfect, they will drive you crazy. <laughs> Please get one who's bent and twisted and all over the place, but who loves you. That's much better. Okay? But, yes, thank you, Ajahn. There was a question over there last, this is absolutely the <laughs> last question. I, pr I promise, I promise. No, that's okay, one more. It's actually a good hook for those, um, if your question, especially those online, hasn't been answered today, you can come back tomorrow. So that's the hook to get you back in tomorrow. Yeah. Hi, Arjun Brum. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, you talked about being able to let go of things in the past, but I think I can speak for a lot of people when what's in the future can be a cause for anxiety despite the fact it's not even here yet so my question to you would be how do you let go of the anxiety of what's to come rather than what's happened okay the point is the future is work in progress we don't know what's going to happen for the future even Ajahn Chah was once asked by someone can you read the, the, the lines in the palm of my hand and Ajahn Chah, you know, he took a lot of persuasion. He said, okay, I'll read the, the lines in the palm of your hand to tell you your future. I think you know the story. He just traced every line and every now and again, he said, oh, look at that. Mm, that's a bit worrying. Mm. He, this guy was wound up so much. 
So what's my future going to be? And Ajahn Chah said, I'm not wrong, I can't lie. Yeah, what's it going to be? Come and tell me. He said, your future, sir, is uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> and that was so true. Your future is still being made. People who are anxious create a bad future because of their anxiety. I did mention to you that on, so it's a Tuesday, not Monday, when I get back to Perth, I'm teaching at Solaris, they call it now, they've had many names for it, Cancer Centre over in Perth. I've been teaching there for about 33, 34 years, every year. And I once asked, why do you keep inviting me? Every year. And they said, because one of their leaders when I gave my first talk at that place, it was just called a Cancer Support Association, one of the leaders there, they asked me a question. They said they had uh, breast cancer and had to have you know, the surgery, the breast taken off. And they said that was so traumatic and so painful. I don't know if there's any one ladies here who've had breast cancer, had mastectomies. You know, as a guy, you can't really understand what it feels like. But it's so painful and so psychologically painful. And they asked me the question, said, no, I'm in recession now. What would happen if it came back? That was their question. And I said something very simple. What would happen if it never came back? And I didn't realize how powerful that statement was for her. She said that solved her problem. She never thought it has to come back. She opened up to the, the probability. It's not logical, this is emotional. It might never come back. It never came back but she made sure I came back every year for about 25 years before she got too old to come anymore. Remember the worry usually helps bring about what you're worried about. Imagine cancer if you got so worried about that. That makes your stress levels go up and it means that that is probably one of the major causes those of you in relationships, you're thinking your partner, what happens if you know, he does something wrong or she does something wrong? What's going to happen? That stresses you out so much, you became a pain to live with. And what you're afraid of, you help happen. I think you all understand much, much about relationships. What would happen? if we can't pay off all the debts for uh, Santi Monastery. You'd have to go to jail, Karunika. <laughs> People can worry like that. Well, I guarantee, no worries at all. Financially, I wouldn't put me in charge of any company. I do stupid things. But it all works out in the end. I don't know how, but it does. So, don't worry. Do you accept that? Yes. Okay, great. So I guarantee you will not get breast cancer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's enough. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you so much.